Hey everyone, good morning and welcome to our online services. Okay, so today, we've got two readings today. The first one is, is Romans 1, 18 to 25. If you don't have a Bible, we do have them at the back of the church and they're a gift to you. So please grab one so you can open to the reading. So God's wrath against sinful humanity. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness, wickedness of people who suppress the truth by the wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, been understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over to the sinful desires of their hearts of sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. The second reading is from Ephesians 2 and it's actually 1 to 5, not 1 to 4. So keep reading as we go. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived amongst them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Good morning, everyone. My name's James. I'm the senior pastor here. And if I haven't got to meet you yet, I'd love to get to know you after the service. Today, we're starting off a three-week series as we ask some tough questions. Um, today, we're talking about hell. And so let's um, come to God now in prayer and ask him um, for help. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that we can ask you tough questions. There's nothing too tough for you. Thank you for making yourself known to us in your word, the Bible. And so, Father, we pray now that your spirit will be at work in us, lifting the veil so that we can see Christ more clearly, understand your holiness more deeply, and see um, the gospel with more delight. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I couldn't tolerate it. It just seemed too unfair. Now, that was me yesterday at about midday. I'm standing there on the side of the soccer field. Well, I was actually standing undercover because it was raining and I was watching one of my sons from a little bit of a distance, watching them play. But I just turned my eye to another field to teenagers playing. And there's this moment where I saw this person attacking. They had the ball and he's running and he's 
dodging through the, 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 the defence. And then all of a sudden, you see this, this big defender just boom. Now, I believe you're not allowed to do, well, you're not allowed to do that in soccer, I believe. And it, it knocked this person over. And the ref didn't see it. And I'm like, that's just not fair. Now, this 10-year-old boy who was there next to his dad, he said, that's not fair, dad. Come on, ref, you should have seen it. Now, the ref didn't see it. And so nothing was done about it. And it just seemed unfair. Now, if I was the one who pushed that player over in that moment of heat, and I got pulled up by the ref... I would say, come on, that is a a little bit unfair. Couldn't you just tolerate a little bit of, you know, cheating? But life, sometimes we ask those questions or we go, it just seems unfair. There can be times where we hear of horrendous things that are done and they should have faced life in jail and they're let free and it's just not fair. Or maybe you just think, it's just not fair that I'm going to live 70 to 80 years. I'm going to do pretty good. I may, you know, I'll do a few little white lies or a bit, of a, a bit of a twist on my tax return. But why is, it just seems unfair that after 70 years of working hard, having a good family and, and serving at the local RSL or, or in a, a community hub and, and just doing a few, it just seems unfair that God would send me to hell. Because see, the day we're talking about that subject of hell, How can a good God send people to hell? It seems unfair. Because see, at the heart of it is the objection that a good God could send people to hell. So today we're going to be looking at that question, how can a good God send people to hell? But you might be sitting here as you think about this name hell, as you picture hell or as you've heard how hell's been pictured, you might think it is, seems a bit unfair that he would send people to hell. And often it's because we have a variety of objections. I've got three for you that maybe you've shared. The first objection is, I'm just too good. Aren't I good enough? That's the first objection. Surely I'm decent enough to outweigh some of the things I've done. I've been a good person. I've served in the community. Another objection could be that hell seems a little bit too severe. It seems to be that the the punishment doesn't fit the crime. Or another objection could be is that, but isn't it a God who's loving and good? It just seems too far for him to do that. God is too good and too loving. Sometimes we have those objections. Maybe you share those objections here today, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian. But see, the objection number three is really what we're going to be looking at today. How can a good God send people to hell? And I reckon as we answer that question, it actually answers all the other objections that we will ever have about hell. And so let's have a look at it. And so what we're going to do, we've said some objections, but now I want to ask the question, what is hell like? And I reckon the reason we ask that question and the reason we have objections is because of the language that the Bible uses in relationship to hell. It's imagery that that stirs our emotions and makes us feel something that we think, that seems unfair. See, the Bible uses words like fire. It uses words like punishment. It uses words like darkness, restlessness, exclusion and separation. It uses the word for second death. It uses weeping and gnashing. That's some of the language across the Bible that is used in a way to describe hell. And yet out of all of this, the imagery that is really the most gripping and confronting is the word Gehenna that Jesus uses in the Gospels to describe hell. See, Jesus uses this word called Gehenna often as a word, as imagery for hell. Now, Gehenna is a place just outside of Jerusalem. It was a valley. It was a place that was despised and detested by the people of God. It was a place where pagan worship happened. It was a place where People in the Old Testament, even in the New, would go there to do child sacrifices to Molech, 
Kids were sacrificed to the gods there. It was a place of sewage where you poo and you wee were there. It was where there was dead bodies stacked upon dead bodies. It was a valley was filled with that. Sometimes it was fire was going 24-7. And Jesus uses that picture and that image to describe hell. And it's confronting. It was a place where there was horrendous sin and pagan worship that took place. And as you can notice, there's, there's heaps of words that are used to this fire, darkness. And, and, and you think, oh, how does this go together? Well, see, what I think the Bible's doing is it's using descriptive language to describe to us something beyond our imagination. It's aiming to describe to us something that is indescribable for us to comprehend. And it wants us to get these images of what hell is like. And here's what hell is like. There's three things I think we, we, we learn here. And, and the first is that it's a place of punishment and justice. Did you notice that in that language? Well, you even notice it in Revelation chapter 14. That's going to come up on the screen. It says, They too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. That's language of punishment and justice. So we see that it's a place of punishment but it's also a place of separation as well. Have a look at Jude 13. It's going to come up on the screen. They are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shame, wandering stars for whom blackest darkness has been reserved forever. It's this language of separation, of darkness. We also hear Jesus says, depart from me. That's a break in relationship. It's a place where there's no relationships. Hell is actually the very thing that darkness wants. We want God gone out of our lives and hell is saying, God, get out of my life. See, if Jesus is the light of the world, hell is darkness. Hell is a place then without Jesus. Those common grace things that we even have today, like doctors, good food, those things and the relationships that we have, even though they're marred by sin and, and rebellion, those things will be gone. So it's a place of separation. It's the darkest darkness. It's, 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 have you ever thought about darkness, dark, like the blackest darkness? You know, even at home when it's night time, you can see things. You can, like, it's not terrible. But when I, I worked in the mining industry for about three years, and so part of my job was to go underground. So you drive 10K around like this, and eventually you'd end up 1K under the ground, and I loved it. But I've never seen blackest darkness until you've gone down there. You could turn all the lights off, turn your light off on your head, and you could sit there and you wouldn't even see your hand. Someone could be standing in front of you and you wouldn't even know they're there. It's that dark. It's spooky. Now, luckily we had lights on the keyboard, but imagine if just for six hours I sat there in that darkness. It's quite isolating. Now, luckily you'd have someone you're working with, even though you couldn't see them, you could talk to them. Imagine that. But see, that's the blackest darkness. But, but at least one thing is about going there. Every day, you'd come back up. There was relief. You could come out and you could go home. But hell, there's never relief. It's forever. Did you notice that? It's a place forever. It is a place forever where that darkness will be the blackest darkness. And, and we see that in, in, in Mark chapter 9 and in Matthew chapter 25 that's going to come on the screen. This, this language of the worm that eats them do not die and the fire is not quenched. In Matthew 25 it says they will go away to eternal punishment but the righteous to eternal life. That's, that's, that's language of forever. It's a place forever. It's hard for us to grab all our mind with that considering we live 60, 70, 80 years if we're lucky. C.S. Lewis who um, was a a teacher at Oxford University who wrote books, who was a novelist, who, who was a philosopher. He said this, 
He said, Christianity asserts that every individual human being is going to live forever. And this must be either true or false. Now, there are good many things which would not be worth bothering about if I were going to live only 70 years, but which I had better bother about very seriously if I'm going to live life forever. Perhaps my bad temper or my jealousy are gradually getting worse, so gradually that the increase in 70 years will not be very noticeable. But it might be absolute hell in a million years. In fact, if Christianity is true, hell is the precisely correct technical term for what it would be. And do you notice what C.S. Lewis is saying there? He's saying, okay, you might be 35 and you've started to get a little bit of bitter. You got bitter about something in life. And so it just sort of sits there kindling away and you get to 40, 45 and that bitterness doesn't go. But it just gets a little bit worse year by year. And by the time you get to 70, it's there, it's big, but it's not that big. Right? Or you have jealousy. You're jealous of someone else whose career has gone in front of you. Someone else who got the money that you didn't get. And, and that jealousy just builds up a little bit. And over 70 years, by the end of your life, that jealousy is bigger, but it's not that big a deal. But imagine if it built over a million years. Imagine that, that bitterness and that anger, if it was let to go for a million years, that would be hell. And that's what hell is. That discontentment becomes more discontentment. Do you notice that this, this language is very confronting? It's, it's imagery, it's, it's language to make you want to feel something. Do you notice that? I think that's what it does in the Bible. It makes you stop and feel it. It's intense. It's just intense thinking about it without even talking about it. And the Bible wants us to be awoken to that, to be made alive, to see what hell is, to use language that, to describe something that's even indescribable for us to get our head around, to stop and to think. In a way, I think it's, it's to remove our comfort for a moment so that we can see the reality. Now, when I was over in Jerusalem earlier this year, on my last day, I was going to catch a plane at 6pm that night, but that morning, as I've walked out of the hotel room to go walking around Jerusalem... I didn't know it, but there was a hole in front of me and I put my ankle in there and guess what I did? I sprained my ankle. I went over, bam. And I went down hard because it's all stone in Jerusalem. And I went down and bang. And someone helped me up and I went and sat down. And when you sprain my ankles, they puff up and it was excruciating pain. It was horrible. And it's like, oh man, I've got a 20-hour flight plus today with this foot. And I want to walk around. And so I went, I hobbled to the chemist I tried to talk to him and said, I want a bandage, and I wrapped it up tight, and I got some Israeli Nurofen, which is probably the same as Australian Nurofen, and I popped some of it, and every six hours I kept on it, and it reduced the pain. It sort of took it away, so that for that 20-hour flight, I was like, oh, I sort of forgot about the reality of that ankle. But I get home, and I take off the bandage, and I take off the, stop taking the Nurofen, and I realise again, ah, my ankle was sprained. And in a way, I think this intensity of the language of hell is in a way like removing that nerve. And it wants you in the midst of an Australian culture, in the midst of, of the world that we live in, where we have so much comfort, where we have so much food, where we have so much money, where we become, comfort, become comfortable with the reality of the world that we're in, that we actually are blinded and we become encapsulated by the world that we live in, that we forget that we're even sinners. And we forget the reality of real justice. See, we've had some objections. We're asking the question, how can a good God send people to hell? We've seen what, what hell is like. We've seen that it's a place. We've seen that it's a place of punishment and justice. It's a place of separation, darkness. It's a place forever. And what we're going to do now is we're going to ask a few more questions. We're going to see what the problem is if there is no hell. What is the problem if there is no hell? Here is the problem. It means that people like Hitler and Stalin or people like Jeffrey Epstein will get away with horrendous crimes that will never go punished. That those who have done horrible things to kids will never be brought to justice. It means that the person 
who's been abused or the family whose brother or, or, or son or daughter has been tragically affected by the catching up in drugs and, and the, the, the pursuit of that and the way it destroys families. It leaves them without hope of real justice for the evil that was done. And actually, in a way, if there is no hell, it actually removes the notion that there is any morals or there is any ethics. Because, see, in the end, we can really live however we want without any consequence. But, see, if you believe that those things are evil and that they require justice, well, you're going to need to believe in hell. Because, see, what is the problem if there is no hell? There's no hope for tomorrow. There's no justice in the future. And there is a real need for you right now to go and seek revenge for everything that's ever been done to you. But see, the Bible actually gives us the solution. It gives us the solution and it says hell. First we consider why hell is real and then we're going to consider why a good God can send people to hell. So why can we believe that it's a real reality? Why can we... Why do we need to consider hell? Why do we need to consider hell? We need to consider it because the most vivid and shocking statements concerning hell came from Jesus himself. Jesus spoke about hell more than he spoke about heaven. Because of Jesus. Now let's go there for a minute because for Christians, as Christians here today... We believe that Christ was raised from the dead. As Christians, we believe that Christ lived the life we could not live. He died the death we we should have died. He was raised from the grave. And so we're saying the one who healed, the one who's calmed the storms, if he did that and he's been raised from the grave, unlike Muhammad, unlike Buddha, if he's been raised from the grave, then the things that Jesus says, we need to take really seriously. And because we're Christians, because Jesus is raised from the grave, we need to take the reality of hell seriously. That's why we need to consider it, because Jesus spoke about it. He used vivid imagery. In a way, he warns us. He warns us of it. It's almost like the, um, I noticed now that they've got to re- They've got to put out those speed camera signs again. You know those cars that pull over to the side of the road and there's speed cameras and, and you get alerted. Now they have a sign on the side of the road warning there's a mobile speed camera in front. Now that's there as a warning. So as you drive along, well, hopefully you're already doing the speed limit, but you, you're actually, slow, it's, it's a warning. Slow down, slow down. There's a speed camera in front of you. And in a way, these are warnings from Jesus of the reality of hell. Just because I don't like something doesn't mean that it's not true. See, you can get an MRI and it says you have cancer and the doctor tells you you have cancer and you can not like that. I wouldn't like that result. But it doesn't mean it's not true. See, what is the reality? See, we've seen that Why should we pay attention to this? Well, because Jesus actually spoke about it. But here it is. Here's what what is the reality. How can a good God send people to hell? Well, here it is. For God to be good, he needs to be just. For God to be good, he needs to be just. The moment any of us remove the reality of hell is the moment you actually remove the reality of a good God. It's impossible, I think, for you and me to stand in the presence of something evil or perceived wrong and not be unmoved or indifferent to it. Because we know there's a difference between right and wrong. And so in that moment when we sit there or see something in the presence of evil, our, we can't be left unmoved or indifferent to it. It actually, what's it do inside of us? It actually kindles something in us. It actually kindles up inside of us like we, we're, we're not tolerate, we can't tolerate it. It moves us emotionally. 
There comes there's this, this, this anger towards what has just taken place. We can't, be in, we can't tolerate and we can't be indifferent to it. Now, I've got three boys. I love them. I hope I'm a good dad. Now, you know, I don't always love them perfectly. I don't always be a good dad to them. But because I'm a, a dad who loves my boys and I'm a dad who is a good dad to them, it means I can't be indifferent to them when they do something evil. I can't stand there and watch one of them say something evil or wicked to the other one to get under their skin. Or when one punches the other in the head and gets them in a WWE headlock and tries to fall them down the ground to hurt them, I can't be indifferent to that because I'm a good dad and because I love them and I have to deal. There'll be justice, right? There'll be a punishment for that. It would be unfair and unjust if I was to let it go. And isn't that interesting because amongst sibling rivalry, there's nothing worse than when someone gets away with something when you didn't. And it's the same with God. God is too good to remain indifferent to sin. Hell is hell because God is good. Hell is hell because God is just. See, not even a gram of sin, not even a speck of dust of sin can be in the presence of God. He cannot tolerate it because he is good and just and loving. And how do we know that God is good? How do we know that he's just? It's because God is holy. This language of holy, the holiness means that God is set apart from creation. He's set apart from us. He's transcendent. He's above all. To be holy means that God is the one who is the truth on what is right and wrong. Holy means that God, he, he doesn't like evil. He's free. It means God is free from all evil as well. God loves all truth and all goodness. He loves purity and he detests impurity. He doesn't tolerate evil and he's repulsed by all evil and all sin. And that's why we can't stand the presence of God. That's why we have this imagery in the Old Testament. These pictures of where you cannot be in the presence of God as humans because of our sin and our wickedness. And we'd be just poof, done away with. It's like that, you know, those magicians with a tissue paper. I was hoping to find some this week and bring it on stage with some matches and burn it. But you know that tissue paper you can get? And, and, and it's almost like you get the match and you go, Poof, and the tissue paper just goes, Poof. well, that's what it's like in front of a holy God with sin and wickedness. It's just poof. Now, in Exodus chapter 33, verse 22, we read this because Moses has come before God, the holy God. He's sort of protected from him. And Moses is like, God, show me your glory. And God's like, ah, I'm going to have to cover you by my hand until I pass by you because I can't tolerate that. I can't tolerate, but I'm going to cover you so you can just get a little glimpse. We get to Isaiah chapter 6 and Isaiah is a prophet. He's been brought into the throne room where it says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He's getting a glimpse of this holiness of a God who is intolerant to sin and to evil. And what's he say? I am ruined. Woe to me. He, he reveals, I'm, I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. We get to the book of Habakkuk, chapter 1, verse 13, and it says, this is God, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. See, he's, God cannot tolerate a single drop of sin or evil or wickedness. And in a way, like for us in, in, in a Western culture here in Australia right now, we too have cultural intolerances today. We don't tolerate racism. We don't tolerate domestic violence. We don't tolerate drugs that destroy families. And we, we don't tolerate drink driving. And the, and the list can actually go on. We actually, as Australians, there is things we do not tolerate because we see that that's wrong. 
So now let's just picture that just for one moment with us who, who do not have full understanding. Imagine the same, imagine how big it is on the scale of who God is then. Imagine that on a bigger scale of how big God is and how holy he is and how much he cannot tolerate sin. See, what is the reality? For God to be good, he needs to be just. Because God is a good and holy God, he cannot see sin and overlook it, but it has to be punished correctly for it to be fair. The very nature that God is good means he has to be just. Because I think one of the reasons we struggle with this concept of hell and a good God is that we try to separate judgment and love. We try to separate goodness and punishment. We think that they're ferociously and fearlessly opposed to each other. That to be good means that you can't punish. Rather, the Bible says, no, they actually go together. To be good, to be loving is to be righteously angry and to have justice sought, to be punished for it. So they go together. Now, to have real, pure love and pure goodness, you need justice. You need punishment. We need hell. Now, which is interesting because... In a way, we don't tolerate certain things in our society, but actually the values of our world, the values of our worldview at the moment says differently in Western culture. It means you can get away with anything really without consequences, that you are to feel indifferent to certain things, but the moment that you start to feel indifferent the world says, is the moment that you've started to lose love. It's the moment you've started to lose goodness in that moment when you're intolerant to those things. Whereas the Bible says, actually, it's in those moments that we lose love and we lose goodness. See, sin equals evil. Now, you might think, what, what is sin? You might be here and you think, well, what, what's, what, you talk about sin, James. You, well, actually, sin is just, it's just evil. That's another way to put it. Like, it. It confronts us more, doesn't it? But see, what sin is, it's, it's the personal assault on God. It's a personal assault on God who created you. See, sin is by us saying, I'm going to live however I want to live with no respect to the God who's created me. The one who's designed me, the one who's made you right now, who's, who's created you with that kind of hair and, 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 and your personality and your genetics, that God who's done that, well, sin is in that moment. You're saying, well, God, I'm going to live my way. I'm going to live my sovereign life. And I'm really not worried about how you consider I should live, but I'm going to live my way. And in that moment, that's sin. It's a personal assault on God who created you. And God, if you have you noticed, if God is good, he cannot be indifferent to that. And every time that we do that with sin and our evil, every time we do that, guess what it does? It kindles. You know, kindling at the start of fire, it actually kindles the wrath of God. His righteous anger, his righteous wrath. It actually starts to kindle kindle that and and it builds that because he is intolerant of those things because he's a holy God. And really that's what Romans 1's sort of starting to share with us a little bit that Lindsay read for us so well. Romans 1 is about the wrath of God and about sin and about us exchanging the glory of God. Have a look there at verse 18, if you've got your Bibles open. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 says that the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godliness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. See, in our sin, we suppress the truth of God. In our sin, we say hell isn't real. In our sin, we suppress the the truth that God is a righteous God. But God is a wrathful God. Now, John Stott says this. He says this quote, God's wrath is his steady, unrelenting, unremitting, uncompromising personal antagonism to evil in all its form and manifestations. That's from his book, The Cross of Christ. That's God's wrath. And see, in verse 19, we notice that 
since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. Like God's made, just without the Bible, creation. He's made himself known even as you look at creation. And yet we've suppressed that. Even though we know God, we, we don't want to glorify him. Our foolish hearts are darkened by sin. Verse 23, we've exchanged the glory of an immortal God for images. What that means is that God, who created good things, we take the O out of good and we make those things he created good God things. They're the things in which we now find our significance, our contentment, our happiness, our relationships in rather than in him. And in that moment, we've exchanged that. That's what sin is. You may not have murdered someone, but maybe you're finding contentment in food and happiness. And when we do that, it's a personal assault upon God. And therefore, he gives us over to our sinful desires. But he can't be indifferent to that. The rest of the Bible tells us he can't be indifferent to that. See, what's the reality then? Well, the reality is for God to be good, he needs to be just. And therefore, for God to be good, what do we need? We need hell. For God to be a good God, we need hell where he puts the injustices right, where there is punishment. See, if we, had any, if we have any real understanding of sin and evil, if we have un, any understanding really of how good God is and how loving he is and how holy he is, the more we understand that, we wouldn't actually be asking the question, how can a good God send people to hell? Actually, the more we understand the holiness and the goodness of God, the other question should be asked is, how can a good God not send us to hell? So we've actually got to flip the question. How can he not send us to hell if he's a good God? See, it is unavoidable, the justice of God. God can't overlook it. He can't put it on the carpet. He can't just flow it away. He's actually got to deal with it because he's a God who is holy and good. And so that leaves us with a very major problem that there is no partiality and there's no immunity. We all need to face the wrath of God. But hell is hell because God is good. Hell is hell because God is holy. See, the very existence of hell demonstrates to you the incredible goodness of God. You know, we may think that hell tarnishes the name of God. Actually, it reveals that God is a real good God. Because you and me, we need someone who won't tolerate evil and sin. We want someone who will do something with it. Now, it may seem, you know, you, as you picture hell forever, it's like, well, but hang on, but, but we only live for seven years. It, hell seems too big a punishment for the sin. Well, we need to remember that we're finite beings who have sinned against the infinite God who is eternal and therefore it requires an eternal punishment. See, for God to be a good God, we need hell. See, what have we seen? We've seen some objections, objections so far to hell. We've seen what hell is like. We've seen the language to describe it. We've seen that it's a place of separation, a place forever. It's a place of punishment and justice. We've considered why we should consider hell because Jesus speaks about it more than anyone else. We've seen what the reality is. The Bible tells us that for God to be good, we need hell. That we need to flip the question, how can a God, good God not send us to hell? So that leaves us with our final question. How do we escape it? How is it avoidable? Well, Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that it is. See, how do we escape it? It's the great exchange. See, in Ephesians chapter 2, it says, As for you, you were, dead in your sin. you were dead in your transgressions and sin, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. We were once disobedient sons and daughters of God. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of God's wrath. 
But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. How is it avoidable? How is it escapable? It's being united to Jesus. It's being united to his life, death and resurrection through the cross. It's through being united to him. See, Jesus talks about hell more than he even talks about heaven. And I've been pondering why. Often we use it because we go, no, he's trying to guilt trip us all. Well, see, the reality is if we want to be guilt tripped into heaven without a Jesus, it's really going to be hell anyway because you don't want Jesus. So I've been pondering why. And I think one of the reasons Jesus talks more about hell than heaven is because he doesn't want us to be confused with why he came. We can easily confuse that he came to heal, to give sight to the blind, to give hearing to the deaf, to feed the poor. And they're good things that he has done to come and calm the storm. But he keeps saying, I haven't come for that. I've come to seek and save the lost. He wants us to actually know why he really came. He hasn't come for us to prosper in this world. He's come to set us free from hell. Jesus talks more about it than anything else. How do we escape it? By being united to Jesus in his life, death and resurrection. See, we often talk about the cross in a way of at Easter we go, we watch the Passion movie and as good as that is. And we go, look at the, the, the nails that went through his hand. Look at the body that was suffered for us. Look at the way he was whipped and beaten. We so often look at that and go, oh, look what he did. Thousands of people died that way. You know what was different? It wasn't the nails. It wasn't the beating. It was the wrath of God that had been kindled. Kindled of your sin and my sin. And in that moment, God the Father poured that on his son like a magnifying glass onto his son. And Jesus, God the Father, turns his back on him and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's because of the wrath and the justice of God. He bore hell so that you and me wouldn't have to bear it. See, the gospel message isn't a message about living a better life. It's a message about we cannot do it, but Jesus can. See, it's to be united, to be escaped is to be united to Jesus in his life, death and resurrection. About a decade ago, a plane set off in um, St. Louis, Minnesota. Uh, a plane had para- going up parachuting that day. And Robert Cook was there. He was a pilot. And there was an Australian woman on there by the name of Kimberly Deer. She was on there strapped with a parachute. And as the plane took off, it clipped a power line, blew the motor up, and the plane was going to crash. Now, the problem was they had parachutes on, but they were too close to the ground for the parachutes to work. And so Robert Cook, the driver, grabbed Kimberly. He strapped himself to Kimberly. And he took the impact of that fall. He died so she could live. And that's what Jesus does for us at the cross. He bears the fall of our sin. He bears the wrath of God. Be united to him. See, the gospel is good news that the wrath of God can be appeased through his son, Jesus. See, personally, God owes me nothing as I stand here today. And to end up in hell really is God being totally just. I'm a sinner. I'm a wretch. I've built my own kingdom. I've lived my own way. And the most terrifying thing for us actually should be that God is a good God. But in his grace and his mercy, he's made a way for us back through Jesus. Now, God sees everything. You know, yesterday it was an unfair moment. The the ref didn't see it. I have conversations with my boys after soccer. They said, the ref was biased. He didn't see it. And I say, sometimes the, the ref doesn't see everything. And you've got to be okay with that. And they say, it just doesn't seem fair. But here's the reality with God. God sees every single one of us, every single thought, every single sin, everything. He's seen everything. You can't get away from it because he's a just God. And so what do we do now? 
See, maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus. Or, or maybe you think, well, hang on, if God is an angry God, why hasn't he just removed us right now? Why hasn't he just poured his wrath and his anger right now on us? Well, he's done it at Jesus on the cross. But see, I, I found this illustration helpful that I've heard before. Is that God is a God of, of anger and justice. And right now is the time where he's got a damn wall up. As his anger and his wrath is being kindled, there is a wall there of his wrath being held back. And right now is the time where he's holding that wall back and Jesus says, come to me today. Come and find grace and mercy in me today. Because one day, God is going to remove that wall. Unless you are united in Christ, that wall of wrath will be poured upon you in hell. For those who find shelter in Jesus... You won't be thinking how bad hell is. You'll be thinking how good Jesus is. Because Jesus bared the hell that you should have bared. He bared the hell we should have deserved. Hell reminds us there's no partiality, there's no immunity from hell. You cannot get out of it unless you are united to Jesus. See, we have a choice before us today. Either face hell on your own without the presence of Christ or hide yourself in Christ, in whom there is redemption, forgiveness, and life eternal. Either bear hell for eternity, or let Christ bear it for you. Let's pray. Father, we want to recognise that you're a good and gracious God who is good and just, and you do not tolerate, or you're not indifferent to any of our wickedness or any of our evil. And so, Father, we pray, Lord Jesus, we are sorry for what our what our lives have done to you and to this world. Forgive us. Thank you for bearing all our sin on the cross. Father, we pray that you'll spend your spirit to help us turn away from everything in my life, in our lives, which the Bible says is wrong. And may we follow you, Jesus. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.